I was the first person of color most people in my town had ever seen. Kim Long lives in Shoreline, but that is not where she grew up. In Solon, Iowa, which is a town of 1,100 people um, in southeast Iowa, and I grew up on a 200-acre hog farm. So my culture is literally apple pie, weenie roasts, and fish fries. And apple pie and fish fries in Iowa? Cultural points that have nothing to do with where she was born in Korea. In the early 80s, Kim was adopted by a white family. I was two years old when I was given up, and I think I was like a college love child. And then uh, I was in foster care and um, at the orphanage in Busan for six months, and then I came to the U.S. <laughs> Once again, an orphan airlift touches down at Portland, bringing a group of 24 Korean-American war waifs for adoption into American homes. Because of the Korean War, there are more Korean adoptees like Kim in the U.S. than any other group. An effort started right here in the Pacific Northwest. Yet even after five decades, adoptees like her still face discrimination, experiences her family in Iowa didn't share and didn't help her prepare for. When you were growing up, did you ever feel out of place? Uh, all of the time. <laughs> Right, like I knew that yes. answer. <laughs> and it's still time. happening. Kim just had her first baby Juniper, and at the very first visit to the pediatrician, a microaggression, a subtle discriminatory act, smacked her in the face. The office staff assumed her name wasn't Kim Long, and they actually changed it to Kim Wong. Nowhere on our on our records was there Wong. I'm Kim Long is a, is a German name actually, it's from my parents. Um, and then they clocked me and changed it only for me to Kimberly Wong. <laughs> that racist assumption is the type of encounter her family back in Iowa didn't realize they needed to help her navigate. Back then, adoption agencies told families to raise a child ignoring differences and the cultures they came from. We didn't have discussions about race. We didn't talk about it. We didn't, you know, say, hey, were there any microaggressions that happened today? It wasn't a thing that we ever talked about, right? It was assimilate, assimilate, assimilate. Pretend like there's no difference. It's hard to walk around every day and have people see a black woman, but for me not to even feel like a black woman. A white family in Bellingham adopted Angela Tucker out of foster care. One of the big points that I have highlighted is you said, me telling them that I'm adopted is not going to help me, and it won't help them understand me either. She's now a transracial adoption specialist who helps adoptees across the country embrace their unique stories. It's really dangerous for black and brown transracial adoptees to not embrace their blackness and understand what that means in the context of today's world. Okay, Juhi. Uh -huh. She means if you are an adoptee who's been assimilated, ill-prepared for how the outside world may perceive you, it could cost you your life. I am mentoring a transracially adopted 13-year-old girl who lives in a predominantly white space. And she told me this really interesting story um, after George Floyd was murdered. She had gone to hang out with a girlfriend who's a, a black friend with black parents is not adopted and that friend's parents was giving her the, the talk a lecture about how to act around the police and my mentee was witnessing that and being like wow her parents are really coming down on her hard in a way that was loving still and then she went back to her house and her white parents were really hesitant to talk about George Floyd or police brutality and when they did she said they talked about it with kind of tears in their eyes and said, I'm so sorry that this is the reality. I'm so sorry that you're going to have to deal with this. And so this, my mentee was recognizing and said to me, like, I don't know if I'm prepared to be a black woman in society as I grow up because my parents aren't telling me the same level of the truth of what I saw my black friend and black parents tell her. I thought that was really insightful. Yeah. And almost unavoidable, which is why I recommend that white parents of black kids outsource some of the parenting duties. So I do think that that is a very interesting point to try to outsource some of the parenting, but then 
uh, it's tricky. It's just tricky, right? It's tricky because people are like, well, it's like I'm hiring the help. Like, go find a black person. And for some white adoptive parents, they don't have a community around them that is diverse. So they don't have like a good friend or a neighbor that they can ask to come chat with my kid about this or that. That's also problematic. If you don't have those people in your lives and you really have to look, seek them out, then that also tells me that your world isn't diverse, which that is not safe for the kids. And you can love your children and, yes. and still participate in their oppression through the language you use. Angela's latest project, launched during the pandemic, is her podcast called The Adoptee Next Door. It sheds light on topics like birth reunions and mental health, and now the very hot topic of adoptive parents as white saviors. The idea that white families are heroes for adopting children who are often poor and of color. Oh, well, you would have been um, growing up in abject poverty and here you are, this wonderful life that I'm going to give you while completely ignoring um, that they are not going to experience the world the way you do. But my work, I'm trying so hard to say, who are adoptees outside of what their parents did or thought or didn't do or said? You know, work being done now in the adoption community tries to honor the lives adoptees actually live floating between identities and navigating a world that doesn't always see them for who they really are. Kim says she'll make sure her daughter is raised differently, and it starts with talking about race. I absolutely will do that with Juniper because I think um, not talking about it was the problem. <laughs> Kim Long isn't waiting around for the world to change. She's making sure she's seen for who she really is. Even with something as small as a doctor's bill, the one addressed to Kim Wong. I still haven't paid that bill, by the way. I just, I can't, I'm not a person who doesn't pay bills and I just can't send him the check. Um, so even now, I mean, it's the microaggressions like that. 